really run into anything yet, but I want to be prepared and I'm hoping we have some good takeaways from today's session. Thank you. There you go ahead. Thanks, Laura. And we'll keep things casual because this is a small group, so I have things to say. I hope that I don't just talk at you for you know an hour. Feel free to chime in, ask questions, facilitate discussion. So I think everybody in this room here knows that the last year the brewing industry was overwhelmed with numerous accounts of employees claiming harassment, gender discrimination, and toxic work environments. What started as one woman's account on an Instagram page just spiraled into an industry-wide assault and it has really forced an awakening in this industry. Um, just as troubling as the accounts of unprofessional behaviors are the reports of brewery cultures that have permitted that systemic and pervasive harassment to continue in the workplace uh, with little or no consequence. Breweries have been now called out in the public and they're going to be forced to answer um, for their conduct both in the court of public opinion and potentially in the courtroom as well. So a lot of breweries are now taking this time to examine their workplace conditions to make sure that they are providing a workplace that is free of harassment. Um, hopefully this will be a really positive movement in the brewery industry and for some change that I think is long overdue. Um, breweries may find it uncomfortable to address some of these information, some of these uh, situations and confront this type of behaviors but it is so important that brewery owners, managers, personnel, that they really take the lead and set a top-down example to make a comfortable work environment for all. There's been some really great discussions during this conference about diversity, inclusion, all of those efforts are fantastic. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about some more of the legal compliance steps because if you work in New York, there are a lot of them and um, lawsuits are real and lawsuits cost businesses a lot of money. So we wanna get your brewery in the best shape that if it, hopefully these situations never arise, but will be in the best place to defend the lawsuit if that situation ever does come up. So our first step in our five-step plan is to implement effective policies. So New York law requires all employers to have a sexual harassment prevention policy plan. Raise your hand if your brewery has a sexual harassment policy. Okay, good, that's great. Um, so there's a lot of really specific things that need to be included in that policy. Uh, it's definitely worth making sure, taking a look at your policy and make sure it meets all of the bells and whistles. Uh, it needs to prohibit sexual harassment. It needs to give examples as to what constitutes sexual harassment. It needs to include a mechanism um, for reporting complaints. And that can be really tricky for, for breweries in particular because they tend to be smaller uh, and there may not be a dedicated human resources personnel. You just don't have those resources or perhaps the person who's in charge is you know, the person who may be engaged in the conduct that the employees find troubling or is really good friends with the person whose conduct may be troubling. There's a lot of good external resources um, as well that can be used to set up anonymous hotlines where employees can make reports. Um, those can be really effective and give employees a voice so they're not um, afraid to to actually make a report and the brewery can know if there is an issue. Um, your policy also needs to include a procedure for investigating complaints if one does arise, and we'll talk a little bit more about what this means later. Your policy also needs to include anti-retaliation. Uh, your policy needs to make sure that your employees will not face retaliation if they come forward and make a report of discrimination or harassment. Um, this is not only legally required, but you just want this generally to make sure that you foster an open and respectful atmosphere. If people are afraid to speak up because they think something's gonna happen to them, if they do, that's not really gonna get us any progress in this area. Um, so the, the New York legal requirements only address sexual harassment, but I highly recommend that your policies go beyond sexual harassment and focus on 
all types of harassment, race, age, gender, um, sexual orientation, religion, all different protected characteristics. I think it's really a good practice to, to address all of those and not just single out sexual harassment because um, there's other types of behavior in the workplace that we want to make sure that our employees feel safe and protected from. So then our next um, step in our toolkit is to make sure that you're communicating those policies effectively. It's not just enough for you to have a policy that's sitting on a shelf in a vacuum that nobody knows about. Um, employees need to be aware of the policy. They need to understand the company's expectations around it. Um, I have a bunch of questions up here on the screen. If you respond no to any of these questions about how you communicate your policies, then you should probably be considering some thoughtful ways that you can emphasize the importance of your policy um, with your employees. And you need to make sure that your, work, your workforce is aware of your zero tolerance position on harassment. Um, New York law requires you to distribute your policy to employees. That's a good start, but that's not enough. You really wanna take some additional steps uh, for the, the policy to really become part of the workplace culture. Um, so one of the ways that you can do this at the time that employees are hired, management as part of their onboarding should sit down, review that harassment policy with their new hires, and start a conversation about the brewery's expectations around harassment and discrimination. If you have an intranet site that employees can access, um, some people have scheduling sites that you can post information, it would be great if you post a copy of your, um, your policy there as well, so employees can always know how they can access it. And then you should also make sure that you um, periodically review the, the policy with employees. You don't just wanna give it to somebody on the first day of employment, regularly at staff meetings, you wanna bring it up, you wanna talk about it with your employees, you want to make sure that it's really a way of life that your brewery lives by. Um, so New York law also requires employees to undergo annual sexual harassment training. Has everybody done their annual sexual harassment training? Mostly. Um, so that's great that you guys have that on your radar. Much like your policy, you want this to be more than lip service as well. Um, if you just make it seem like, oh, sorry employees, you have to do this because the law makes us do it and we just need to check a box, that's exactly how employees are gonna treat it. You want it to, to really set a top-down um, uh, you know, way that this is really your culture and that it's not enough that you're just you know, trying to check the box and get things done because you have to get it done. Um, you may also want to consider going beyond just the, the required training, much like the policy, which only focuses on sexual harassment. You can train on all types of harassment as well. Uh, and you wanna also think about things like bystander intervention training, empowering your staff to address um, disrespect when it comes from customers or suppliers and train them on what they can do in those situations. And I think most importantly in that is making sure your employees really know that, um, that you have their back and that uh, no matter what, you're not gonna you know, get mad at an employee because they had to deal with a customer uh, who was treating them improperly. It's so important for employees to know that you have their back in those situations and that you want them to be safe and comfortable and respected in the workplace um, above all else. Of course, please. Um, is there any value in making sure that you have people sign off um, that they read it, even though maybe they haven't read it? <laughs> <laughs> the, I have, I have, so I have it part of the onboarding. Yeah. It's like electronic onboarding. Yeah. And uh, there's basically like, well, here's the document, and but it's part of uh, an overall handbook, handbook, right? Um, and we do have to like, click the box and say, yeah, I received it and read it. Is that of value, do you think? 
the lawyer in me says absolutely yes. Uh, I, <laughs> my, my motto is document everything because let's say you know that employee sues, you want to be able to show that they received the, the, the policy and that they, you know, you instructed them on how to handle situations and then you also want to be able to prove that the person that is the alleged harasser in that situation um, received the policy as well. So I think having employees sign off on it is a great best practice to implement. Same with, same with attending training yeah. as well. Yeah. And that, that's built in our payroll system. So, you know, so I'm worth the payroll. Yeah. Click through. Yeah. So. Yeah, sometimes people will, you know, have their their anti-harassment policy in the handbook, but then also have it as a standalone document as well, so it kind of stands out front and center um, with all the other, you know, mumbo jumbo that's in the employee handbook. And we as a, as a brewery also just keep a separate Excel spreadsheet uh, alongside tips training and, and all that other stuff. If we've got a new employee and we do need to take that box, I mean, we hand out that literature when somebody is hired. Yeah. Um, but the last training that we just went through uh, with all of this, we had noticed some turnover due to COVID and new employees. So we just felt, uh, you know, for, uh, for our quarterly meeting, let's say, uh, it was just important to just, you know, go over everything once again with everybody, but also just the, the separate Excel document this person, you know, here's a list of uh, harassment trainings and, and have they not done it yet, uh, if they've been working here for a few months later or something. Yeah. We've got, like, keep a, like, a, like an onboarding checklist and have that like, that's one of the tick boxes of whoever's onboarding and has to point it out. And, you know, even though I know they've already clicked through it because they've probably onboarded them for payroll, uh, themselves for payroll, like, we're going to point out a couple things in here. Mm -hmm. I know you've read it, you know, uh, but here, here are the things, and that, that one, the crazy things that come up about, like, people don't know how to file for, like, time off, you know? Right. <laughs> you know, the things that are always, like, that always come up, but those things where you're, like, you do want to say, well, it's part of our onboarding, you know, oh, yeah, I think that box, I did read it, um, we actually, we touched on it personally, too, and it's, like, literally part of that checklist for whoever's really on. Right. But that, that goes back to, you know, my point about making sure it's ingrained in your culture and not just, you know, that you're putting together a policy for people to check the box. You know, there should be no doubt in your employees' minds because you're constantly reiterating the importance of it um, that, you know, it, it's not just, you know, okay, you have to check the box on, on day one. We want to have it really be front and center at employees' minds. Um, what are you all using for, for training? Are you using online tools? Are you doing you know in-person training yourself? Are you bringing in outside people? No, I usually use Viva. Okay. It's great because it does track everything. Yeah, yeah. You keep checking into the app and see like, okay, we're going to take the help when this way not do that. So, you know, touch all of them. And um, then, because it has the, the anonymous reporting tool, for customers and for employees, it's, it's a nice package. And it can work on the personability and it can work on the personality. That's a Great. Yeah, and do you find like employees find it effective? How? They, yeah, from, so coming from the corporate world, I've taken a lot. <laughs> <laughs> It is, yeah. 
Yeah, it's so weird. It, it, I think we pay 20 bucks a month. Okay. Right. Which is great. And that includes that and all these reports. Yeah, and yeah. Then, yeah. I know the discounts are, the, there are discounts too from, through the VA. And, yeah, and that's, that's, that's what we get with the discounts. So, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's more fun. Yeah, yeah. We, we, did, we did some in person yeah. about sexual harassment yeah. training that um, the state, our, our state VA had a service that was like, we were able to use for in person sexual harassment mm -hmm. specifically a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And we had them down to New York City and hosted for the all the brewery grounds to oh, and, and restaurants and bars, like whoever our customers wanted to come. Mm -hmm. And we did like three or four sessions at the brewery, like in the afternoon, different afternoons and stuff. That people could come and do it, and it was, it was a nice benefit for our customers too, because they have to check this box too, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and to also educate everybody that they only have to do it once as an employee, because we have employees that work in different places, right? They don't want two shifts at one place, and two shifts at another. Mm -hmm. They only have to do it once. But I don't know whether that's still in place, mm -hmm. but it was a nice uh, in person to yeah. after they work. Yeah, I think it's worth, you know. Maybe not every year for your annual training, but you know, every once in a while, really doing it in person, and it allows you to to customize the training really to to your workplace and your situation. Which I think, um, like you mentioned, a lot of the the bad, dry ones <laughs> that you sat through in the corporate world don't always relate to the brewery setting. So it can, um, so it's nice to be able to customize a little bit, and I think it also sends the right message to your employees about how important you view this, that it's not just something we want you to like you know, sit down on a computer, you want to be able to foster discussion um, around it as well. Okay, so we'll move on to our step three here, and that's training your managers. So we all know that everybody needs to be trained pursuant to New York law, um, but training your managers in particular is so important to help you um, avoid some common mistakes in dealing with workplace harassment. Your brewery can be held legally liable for any proven harassment that is carried out by a managerial employee. Whether you knew they were doing it or not, if it's a manager that's doing it, your brewery can be liable for that person's conduct. And more than that, your managers in the eyes of the law um, are your brewery. So if they know something, even if they don't go and tell ownership and the people who would be writing a check if there was a lawsuit, um, you as the brewery are deemed to know about it, even if they just knew about it and said nothing um, with that. So it's, uh, and for those reasons alone, it's so important that your managers really know what to do, how to handle situations, and that you drill into them to report things to you, um, no matter how small or slight it may seem to them. Um, there's a couple of common mistakes to warn your managers about at these training sessions. Um, first is that many companies get into trouble when managers ignore inappropriate behavior that they believe is welcomed by the employee um, or it appears to be mutual and voluntary. Um, Victims of harassment may often just pretend to go along with something because that is the easier thing to do and they want to be part of the team and they don't want to make waves, um, but in their head, they would love for it to stop. And that is a great way for a manager or somebody in authority to step in if they see something, even if it seems like both people are willing participants, um, you know, to step in, interrupt the situation, and put a stop to the conduct. That applies to employee-employee interactions, employee-customer interactions, uh, interactions that your employees may have with vendors or other people that you partner with. Um, another reason that it's so important that your managers report things um, to you, you know, they're the eyes and ears of your organization, they're on the floor, they're interacting with employees, they're gonna hear things that you may not hear, um, but they also may not see everything. So they may see one incident and not think that it's a big deal, um, but you know that 
five other big things happened with this employee. And so it's important that all of that information is getting to a centralized uh, person so they know the full picture about what's going on with a particular employee um, and that they can take appropriate steps to address that behavior. Um, another common mistake is allowing extra leeway for certain employees because um, they just think that that person's behavior is a harmless uh, personality trait. So, you know, just because it's, uh, or that, you know, somebody is super high up in the company and thinks that they're, you know, beyond reproach. Perfect example of that is Harvey Weinstein. Look at how many people let the behavior that went on in that organization just go on. It does not matter if, you know, it's the Weinstein company. You can't just turn a blind eye because of that. You need to address the conduct no matter who it is. And then a third common complaint is making sure that you're, or a third common uh, trap here is making sure that your managers know how to recognize a complaint. A complaint is not always going to be an employee, you know, walking in the office and saying, I would like to lodge a complaint about harassment. Um, we, we rarely see that happen. A complaint may come in the form of, you know, oh, I don't want to work with that person. He really gives me the creeps. Um, or, you know, you can just tell that they're uncomfortable being around somebody. That managers have to recognize that those things that, you know, may not be somebody saying, I'm going to lodge my official complaint, may be a complaint, and they need to um, report that and make sure that appropriate steps are being taken. Um, also, managers need to understand their obligation to take every complaint of harassment seriously. They shouldn't assume that the person who is making the complaint is just being oversensitive, or they shouldn't, um, they shouldn't make credibility determinations based on the reputation of the person who's complaining or the person who they are complaining about. The managers really need to remain objective, um, to treat all complaints seriously, and that way appropriate steps can be taken to address it. Any questions about managers before we move on? No, unfortunately <laughs> not. <laughs> I'm sitting here going through, oh yeah, I had somebody say, like, oh, they didn't like working with so and so. And then I'm like, oh crap, should I have documented? And I mean, look, like, they were like, obviously there are reasons that people may not like working with each other besides yeah. it being harassment. But just, you know, have your, your spidey senses open for those yeah. things. And if somebody makes a comment like that, have a further dialogue. Oh, why is that? Yeah. Um, and see what they say about that so you can understand, you know, really what's going on. I think there's a, a question of, like, what is the definition of harassment? That, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I had not thought that I didn't know that, but maybe you um, ask the question. Yeah, you know, these aren't these aren't easy conversations and these aren't easy topics and everybody's um, everybody's internal views and internal sensitivities are different. So it's really hard that, you know, somebody may say something to you and in your head you think, what are they upset about? That doesn't seem like a big deal, but everybody has their own unique perspectives and come with their own um, backgrounds and their own stories that are going to cause them to see um, the, their own viewpoints and the world from their own lens and you know it's really trying to, to understand that and um, make sure that that everybody um, is respected in the workplace and feels comfortable in the workplace and look these aren't these aren't easy things to do and we're certainly not going to solve them sitting here um, today in, in one session. So next we'll move on to um, promptly investigate any complaints that are raised. Have any of you had situations where complaints of harassment were, were raised in your brewery and you had to do an investigation? Yeah, how did that process go? Uh, it, was, it was fairly swift. Um, I'm, I'm the GM at the, at the tap room for our brewery 
through. So uh, once I was made aware of the issue, uh, within 48 hours, um, the investigation that happens, uh, interviews, uh, interviews happens, um, different different perspectives, just you know, giving the entire picture of everything, and uh, within 48 hours, uh, the uh, um, the recipient of the complaint was was let go. That's great. Um, a lot of people don't act with that immediacy, and that is. Um, that's our first step here, is that when you do get a complaint, you want to take immediate action. If you delay your investigation, um, you think that, you know, oh, I'll wait until a better time to deal with this. I'll wait until we get, you know, X done, or this important project is over with, then we'll address it. You're gonna send a signal to your workplace that this is not a priority. So your example is fantastic, that everything was done and addressed and corrective action was taken in 48 hours. That is something we should all be striving for. The plate, um, was, the plate was clear once, once I was made aware of everything. And, and that, that was going on that week. Right, that's it's, exactly it's how it should be. Um, uh, so that's, that's really commendable. We had, a, we had a similar situation. I'm curious to see if this happened to you on that case too. I was made aware and dealt with it fairly, fairly promptly with, you know, within finding out the information. Uh, but it happened before. It was like there were previous incidents that weren't reported that were then like, well, this isn't the first time. And I was like, oh gosh, <laughs> like wait a minute. And it's not. It doesn't this feel like. Third time this has happened. Well, it was, was kind of an ongoing thing for a few weeks that it happened once I was out of the building and kind of in, in the back of the house and. Uh, it wasn't my proudest moment as a manager because I like, feel like I've, I've got my yeah. finger on the pulse uh, with, with everybody. Yeah. Uh, so with, with uh, I just didn't feel the best about myself having not noticed what was going on. But it was just a few, you know, quick, quiet instances that have, that have happened, you know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, we take our zero tolerance policy extremely seriously. Um, so, so yeah, it was just once, once I was made aware, you know, uh, things evolved, started rolling. Yeah, that's I had to go back with my staff and talk about the zero tolerance because I was like, there were numerous employees that knew about what had happened and no one had said anything. So, tough, tough situation. But not, I dealt with it promptly just because we don't know. Yeah, and that's why it's so important. All the Steps one, two, and three that we got to here, you know, constantly reinforcing your policy, doing the right training, communicating it, making sure that that is a way of life so employees know, hey, this happens, we need to report it. Um, and you're not in a situation where employees, you know, either don't feel comfortable or don't know, that they don't know that maybe they should be reporting it. And for your other point, you know, that about other things coming out as well. That's really common when you dig into an investigation, unfortunately. Maybe there's other incidents with the particular employee that's complaining, or maybe there's other employees that have complaints as well. Um, and you should be you know, prepared for that, and you're gonna need to investigate those too. You, know, you can't view the investigation in a vacuum and say, well, this employee complained about X, and somebody else you know, is coming into the scene, and we learn about this, don't ignore that. That's now part of your investigation as well and part of the big picture. I mean, one of the things like, I commonly see with lawsuits is you know, employees get really upset when it's not so much that something happened. I mean, they're not happy if something happens, but I think a lot of times the motivating factor between you know something happening and them actually then taking the next step to filing a lawsuit is did the company do anything and if they feel like the company ignored it didn't act quickly enough months later you know it's still being investigated that's when employees the flip switches and now it's like all right i can't resolve this internally i'm going to go talk to a lawyer i'm going to see what my external options are so not only is investigating the right thing to do, I think it also helps to cut off lawsuits when employees feel like, hey, they are taking it seriously, they are investigating it, they are moving quickly, and they are taking corrective action in a quick way. Actually, I actually have a question. Yeah. So this can, this can go for customer customers. Absolutely. And so, and we've had 
harassment incident with a customer where we also took care of very simply and that customer is no longer a customer. Um, but is there actually any legal compliance when it comes to that interaction? Like, because it's not, it's not right. like both right. people are in your house. It's not like you're responsible for both of those people. So what is the legal, is there anything legal when it comes to customer yeah, so, th so there is. I mean, you obviously can't control the behavior of every customer who walks in the door before they walk in the door and know exactly what they're going to do. But you, as an employer, have an obligation to provide a workplace that is free of harassment. So if a customer is engaging in harassment in a way that the brewery is aware, um, whether that's because managers are seeing it happen or the employee themselves lets you know, hey, this is going on, you then have an obligation to address that in some capacity, you know, whether that is asking the customer to leave, banning them, you know, just switching out the, the waitress, you know, hey, you're off that table, we're gonna sub somebody else in, no questions asked. You have to provide that employee with that harassment-free workplace. I mean, if a customer is like whispering something in their ear and nobody sees it and they're not telling anybody, that doesn't automatically trigger legal liability for you because a customer did something. It's more if you know something is going on, either because the employee says something or it's done in an open way that people are witnessing it, managers are seeing it, that's when it could trigger liability if you're not taking steps to address it and remove them from that situation. And I would even add to, uh, this happened at a previous establishment uh, that I was managing, but even if uh, you know, your employee is strong willed enough to deal with that situation themselves mm -hmm. and stand up for themselves with your customer. You should reinforce, uh, you know, I'm glad that, I'm glad that you were able to handle that, you know, in a professional yeah. manner, but we still have your back. If that happens next time and you don't want to deal with it, we're here for you as well. Absolutely. Yeah, agreed completely. And that relates to what I was saying about sort of ignoring um, welcome behavior. Maybe that's not welcome behavior, but you think, oh, they have it. Look, they're, you know, they're giving the, it right back to that customer. They shouldn't have to do that. So, you know, take them aside, step in. Are you okay? Do you want me to have somebody else cover this customer? Do you want us to ask them to leave? There are things you can do, you know, just because they can handle it doesn't mean they should. And knowing that their managers have their back and are willing to you know, step in and notice, hey, that's not a great situation. What can we do to make things better for this employee? I mean, that will just go such a long way with your employees. Yeah, and it wasn't uh, necessarily harassment related, but we, uh, we require proof of vaccination since last August to enter. Mm -hmm. um, there can be some adversarial conversations there. Uh, that's, a, that's a whole nother uh, so, panel. So I, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll look briefly on this, but. Start of it all, you know, my only rule with everybody was if you don't feel like dealing with anybody at any given time, cut it off, come get me immediately for this, you know. And, uh, and you know, my bartenders were called some pretty colorful names in the first couple of months there. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not their policy, yeah. you know. Um, and uh, we didn't feel guilt because we, we thought that we knew we were doing the right thing by, by doing that um, in our opinion. Um, but uh, that's also sort of opening up your, your employees to those sorts of difficult conversations they wouldn't normally have. But because we have this policy, we just have to reinforce, hey, you know, like, if anybody's giving you the business, just mm -hmm. cut it off. Yeah, we did the same thing. We did, we, you know, say we didn't have to enforce vaccinations as much as we wanted to, but um, masking was frame of mind applies perfectly though to harassment. Those are the types of things that your employees should know and feel comfortable if they're dealing with a customer that they don't feel comfortable dealing with. It should be you know, automatic that they can go to a manager or somebody higher up 
and no questions asked, they're taken out of that situation. I mean, somebody in, in the session yesterday, um, the, the women in diversity session said, you know, that they had a code word um, that they have that an employee can just go up to another employee and say that code word, and it's like, no questions asked, they will take over for that, and they will be removed from that situation. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good tip, like, yeah. come up with, you know, whatever, broccoli. Whatever it is, yeah. 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 it'd be like, you get so ridiculous and random. Yeah. 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 My, my husband and I, our, our safe word when someone has to leave a party is falafel, so you can <laughs> <laughs> borrow that one. And, unless you serve falafel at your brewery, then it might get confusing. <laughs> Okay, um, so some of you have gone through the investigation process. For those of you that haven't, do you know what you would do? Like who would do an investigation if someone came forward in your workforce with a complaint of harassment? How would you get that investigation done? Do you have a dedicated person that you think would, would run point on that investigation? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I think that's written into our policy. I think it has me or my partner, depending, and if we're yep, involved or yep, we're not, yep. like exactly the other person or a third party, if the other is appropriate. That's great. Yeah, and you may you may have to get third parties involved if you know because of the situation, either allegation involved, somebody who would be in the line of reporting or in charge of investigating. Um, or you know, the, just the nature of the relationships are such that it wouldn't be appropriate or objective for for somebody to you know, for example, there's a lot of husband and wife breweries. If the complaint is about the husband, the wife probably shouldn't be the one that is leading the investigation on there. I don't think that they would be objective. Um, but hopefully, you know, none of your breweries are ever in this situation. But there are third-party resources, whether that's you know a law firm like my law firm, an external HR person. I think that the, um, the do they do some investigation work as well, or they just do some HR consulting? I think they just do consulting. I'm not sure that they do investigation stuff. They they main expand Yeah, got it. Okay. Um, Probably figuring that out ahead of time. Right, exactly, because you don't, since it is so important to address things quickly, you don't want to spend a week figuring out, well, who are we going to get to do this investigation? And, and now a week has gone by, and you haven't talked to anybody, you haven't interviewed anybody, um, because you're still trying to get your ducks in a row. So um, you're cool at the outset of this, you know, failing to prepare is preparing to fail, and that's completely appropriate here. You just want to have some things lined up, think about you know, what you would do in this situation uh, and how you would handle it and who's going to do the investigation. Um, there's not going to be any cookie cutter approach to doing investigation because it's really going to be dependent on the unique circumstances that are involved, but there are some common threads that are involved in a reasonable investigation. Um, the first best practice would be to get um, a report from the complaining employee so you can clearly understand the issues that are at play, what they're complaining about, um, and you know what exactly you're investigating, the specifics of it. Then you want to make sure that you interview all relevant um, witnesses, including those who um, may be able to provide a glimpse into the working relationship between the employees in question. Um, to the extent that there may be full evidence involved, you want to gather all that as well, whether that's text messages or um, video footage that you may have. You'll want to gather those and make sure that you review them before you conclude the investigation. Um, during the investigation, you'll want to take notes. Um, you'll want to kind of map out what who you talked to, what they said, any evidence that you reviewed, and this will really help you um, think through the claims in an organized way, um, but it will also then serve a legal purpose as well if this ever progresses down the line. It will show that you took the matter seriously, the steps that you took, um, and what you um, reviewed to, to base your determinations in the results of your investigation.
Okay, and then our last step here, um, and this is perhaps the most important one, is taking action against the accused employee if the allegations are substantiated through that investigation. If your employees um, figure out that your policy is toothless, that somebody made a complaint and it was substantiated and nothing happened to that employee, um, they're gonna lose respect for your organization. They're going to stop reporting misconduct. And quite frankly, a lot of people are probably gonna leave um, because it's just not gonna be a comfortable work environment for them. Um, and from a legal perspective, that's also gonna get you into a lot of trouble as well if you knew that there was something going on and you didn't take corrective action. Um, that's something that companies always struggle with is what is the appropriate punishment? And don't, sometimes termination is going to be the only option, um, but there's a big range of things that you can do besides nothing and besides terminating the employee. So you're gonna have to really um, understand what happened, how serious it was, and if there are other things that you can do that will appropriately address the conduct short of termination. That could be giving them warnings, making them go through additional harassment training, um, and uh, having them you know, acknowledge your policies and uh, put them on a final warning. There's all sorts of things that you can do besides just nothing and terminating them. Um, and then it's really important to make sure that you consistently apply your standards to all employees. Um, you can't make exceptions for you know, somebody who's a high performing employee because you don't wanna lose them. Um, you need to treat everybody the same when it comes to holding people accountable for your policies. All right, well that is our five step plan. Um, happy to take more questions, have more conversation around this. Are there, are there any, um, I don't know, any specific cases that have come up for you that you're like, this is like, you know, kind of tips and tricks, kind of way like, you know, obviously like the not doing, knowing about something and not doing something. We've seen that, we see that in news, we've seen that you know, some breweries gotten in trouble for that kind of thing. Yeah, I think, I think that's the, the big thing, knowing stuff and not taking action. And then um, retaliation claims are, are really hot as well. And it's easier for an employee under the law to make out a retaliation claim because they don't have to actually prove that the underlying harassment happened. It's that you know they complained about the harassment or some other conduct and that they were terminated because they um, engaged, because they made a complaint. Um, I'd say, you know, a lot of times they're terminated for another reason, um, not because they made the complaint, they were terminated because, you know, they're bad at their job, they've missed, you know, 10 shifts, but documenting that, um, that employment uh, performance is so key, particularly when somebody has made a complaint because you need to be able to show that your employment decision was made not because they made a complaint, but for, but for these other reasons. So I do a lot of employment counseling where companies just, you know, hey, we have this situation going on and we're gonna be terminating this employee. And one of the questions I always ask is, have they made a complaint about harassment, discrimination recently? because the stakes are just that much more elevated if somebody has. That doesn't mean that you are stuck with somebody forever just because they made a complaint, but you wanna make sure that you're really buttoned up in that termination and that you have you know, documentary evidence that shows the reasons why you're terminating them, that you've given them warnings, chances, opportunities, and they still failed to improve. So you're as buttoned up as you can be if they ever challenge that termination. I just wanna point out too, anybody isn't aware that the Department of Labor does have like a downloadable questionnaire complaint form that pretty much covers all the basis on that. So uh, when I was dealing with, uh, with our situation, I mean, that was, that was good. I mean, we can combine her with, with the policy and with those forms if anybody needs them or whatever, right where everybody writes their hours. So uh, it was easily accessible, but 
it pretty much ticks all the boxes like the, you know, have there been previous complaints before and, uh, you know, it, it pretty much outlines everything that you should be asking and that you should be doing. That's great. That's awesome. I've never had a reinvent the wheel. It was always a good thing. Right, right, right. And most, so most of the stuff you don't have, you know, there's there's lots of resources out there. Um, SHRM, SHRM, Society of Human Resources Management. That's a great resource for a lot of employment-related documents, you know, you shouldn't be having to reinvent the wheel for, you know, a checklist of things to think about when you're doing an employee investigation or when you're going to be terminating an employee. There's so many resources out there. Um, you shouldn't be starting from scratch. So in that case that you were talking about before, like the retaliation claims, uh, I mean, my gut would be that you should wrap up any complaints that they have document the heck out of any investigation, yes. kind of close that, yep. and then start. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I yeah, you know, I mean, look, ideally, if, you know, you wouldn't be, like, terminating an employee so closely after they make a complaint, um, but sometimes circumstances warrant that, and you have a business to run, and if that person is not helping you get your business to where it needs and is impeding that, you know, sometimes you have no choice but to, to terminate somebody. And, you know, sometimes too, a lot of times somebody who's on their, you know, third warning and is getting wind of the writing on the wall, that's when they like to make a complaint about something because they think that it's going to be protected. Um, but that's, you know, one of the keys of just human resources and employment law compliance is just always documenting everything because if you call me up in that situation, like, hey, we are about to terminate this person and they made this complaint, I'm going to say, okay, well, what's, what do we have that shows that they were on their third warning? You don't have any documentation that shows it. It was all just oral. I mean, that's going to be a lot harder to defend if somebody files a lawsuit. But if we have, you know, Here's this, uh, you know, we documented that we gave them a verbal warning on this date, and then a month later we gave them a written warning, and then on this date we gave them a final written warning. Having that trail just makes cases so much more defensible. Yeah. So how do you handle it when you have like two employees that, I don't want to say like she invited this, but like she kind of did, right? Like, she was working behind the bar with, a, like, so it was a man and a woman behind the bar together. They were joking around. She flipped him off. He looked at his watch and goes, I've got time. And then she complained that she was offended by his response to her inappropriate action. How do you handle that? Something yeah, like I mean, there's not like always that. easy answers, um, but, you know, Everybody has lines that they're not comfortable with, but the fact that an employee does engage in their own sorts of behavior like that is something that if somebody's doing an investigation would assess, you know, about their their credibility as to what happened or if they're offended by it. If you know that, you know, this person has done these 10 things that are inappropriate um, and then somebody else does something inappropriate to them and now all of a sudden they're offended, um, you know, that may impact their, their credibility if they're really offended. But perhaps the bigger question in that situation is why is the person who, you know, engaged in the 10 things and, and that, you know, that we've allowed that to happen. And, you know, you don't, just because employees' behavior seems to be welcome, um, both people are engaging in it, you still want to cut that off because you don't know when somebody, you know, it could have flipped in with either person in that situation where the person said, you know, hey, this is crossing the line. So you really just want to avoid getting into those situations at all. So is that a circumstance where you basically talk to both of them? Yeah. yeah. And that, that's, that's what we did. I mean, yeah. I was just like, okay, well, clearly, like, you guys were joking around and you took it too far. You were both party to this, so right. you both need right. to cut it out. And right. Yeah. And if other, if other employees are around too, let's say neither of them were offended in that situation, but other employees are around and witnessing it, 
you'd still want to talk to them about their conduct, even if they're okay with it and they're not making a complaint because you have other employees that are, are seeing it and maybe uncomfortable with it. We don't want to suck the fun out of every workplace, uh, <laughs> particularly breweries where people are going to try to have fun, but there's lines of things that should not be crossed, jokes that should not be made in the workplace, topics that should not be touched upon in the workplace, and we just you know, we can't have any tolerance for that. All right, well, if there's no more questions, I want to thank you guys so much. Thank you for being active audience members and participating in a discussion. It's always so much uh, more fun that way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.